You got a jacket in there or something for me? I thought you didn't like my clothes. Hey, Fitz. I said it was mine when I was 12. Jesus, what the hell happened? Five dead. Nobody saw or heard anything. Now, it's nothing new for this part of town. Kane was the first one on the scene at 11.32, but he didn't see anything either. Three well-armed men have their throats cut before they can even draw their weapons now. Who could possibly move that fast? I've seen a lot of knife wounds, but Manning's boys were killed by something else. Something different. You think the weapon's the key? Yes, I do. I'll send his partner over from the Bureau tomorrow. Partner? Partner? Kane, meet Special Agent Smith. You're kidding, right? Okay, number one on my list. We're going to the crime scene. You drive. We catch this guy. Yeah. We're going to catch this guy over here. Yeah. Ricochets off him. Ends up somewhere over here. Get down! It's a magnet. The most powerful self-contained electromagnet I have ever seen. So how's it used as a weapon? The human body carries a small electrical charge, right? You tune the disc to the charge and then... It's like turning your radio dial to K-I-L-L. -L. Three more like him came in last night. What makes you think they're related to our case? Cause of death. Massive heroin overdose. <laughs> Heron. I think so. The potency was incredible. Your psycho stole a lot of heroin to kill people. dealing with aliens and not from Mexico. The two of them. One's the killer and I think the other one's on our side. Who are you? An officer of the law. Like you. What does he want? Barcy. A priceless drug. Where I'm from. Rare and illegal. What you call endorphins. Dealer. Just a lousy dealer. <laughs> In early January of 1990, Dark Angel aka I Come In Peace arrived in South Korea and made its way across the world during the next few months. It didn't arrive in the UK till July, but audiences in the United States had to wait till September. Its original title was Dark Angel but was renamed to I Come In Peace when it was distributed in the USA. The executive producer for the film, Mark Damon, was interviewed for the UK magazine Impact in 1993 and he said he was never happy with the I Come In Peace title, but had to change it from Dark Angel because of an existing picture was made in 1925 with the same name and couldn't get permission to use it, preventing them from releasing it in the US theatrically under its original name. The movie had a relatively small budget of $7 million, but sadly didn't make its money back on its theatrical run, falling short by a million dollars or so. The producer also revealed in the Impact magazine, that audiences don't tend to come out in large numbers to see Dolph Lundgren on the big screen, but love to watch him on home video, by which the film did very well when it came out to rent on VHS. Dark Angel was given a big push on home video, making its way to Laserdisc in many parts of the world, turning up in France, Holland, Germany and Japan. In the USA, it was issued in the pan and scan aspect ratio in 91, and later again in 96 in widescreen. It made its way to DVD on a bare bones release throughout Europe, and finally made its way to Blu-ray thanks to Scream Factory. 
It included some extra features such as interviews with the director Craig R. Baxley, actors Dolph Lundgren and Brian Benben. It came with a reverse sleeve so you can use the Dark Angel title or I Come In Peace, but the movie has the I Come In Peace title doing the opening credits. The movie was initially titled Lethal Contact, which was revealed in Starlog Magazine issue 158, but was later changed because it sounded too similar to Lethal Weapon. It was based off a spec script written in 1984 by Jonathan Tidor. Once the director was on board, he hired David Kep, who at the time went under the name Leonard Mass Jr. to rewrite it. Craig R. Baxley, who was from a family of stunt coordinators, was apparently the producer's first choice. Craig had worked on a large number of TV shows and films, providing action scenes and made the leap to feature film directing with Action Jackson. That movie was very successful and gave his career a boost. Craig loved the script and was happy to be involved. He was told the movie would have a budget of 20 to 25 million dollars, but when things started moving forward, it was revealed the budget would be 5 to 7 million dollars. So when it came to casting, he had to encourage them to take a pay cut, but pushed the idea that this film would be special, and thankfully everyone involved embraced the production and script. Dolph Lundgren jumped on board the production down to the script, giving him more to do than just action. He didn't just want to be labelled as a muscle man and wanted to broaden his range of movies. Dolph felt the script had some romance, comedy and drama. He expressed he had some decent dialogue for once, he finally got to act. Craig in the recent making of said this was probably Dolph's best performance and Dolph himself is very proud of the movie. They started principal photography in January of 1989 in Houston, Texas and ended in April. In the 1990 issue of Cine Fantastic, there was an article about the film and it revealed the production had gone over schedule by two weeks and the budget had increased from seven to eight million dollars. Craig on the recent Blu-ray release said he was on schedule and under budget and included extra action scenes, for example the extended car chase and having the police car do a cannon roll. When it came to the editing he revealed he shot so many action scenes that many had to be left out. So it's difficult to know if it was produced on its estimated budget or had unfortunately gone over. You can read the old article regarding its budget overrun on the Dolph Ultimate website. For the cast, we have action superstar Dolph Lundgren playing Detective Jack Kane, a Houston police detective investigating a string of drug-related murders, and gets caught up with the FBI and their investigation of two aliens who have come to Earth. Brian Benben, the star of the popular TV show Dream On, plays FBI Special Agent Arwood Larry Smith and becomes Kane's new partner. Larry goes along with Kane's wild stories about aliens, but is still closely working with the FBI and doesn't realise their true intentions of obtaining their technology. Six foot five German action star and martial artist Matthias Hughes plays Talik, credited as the bad alien, the extraterrestrial drug dealer. He shoots his victims full of drugs and then uses alien technology to extract endorphins from their brains, creating a substance to be used by addicts on his home planet. Mateus performed all his own stunts because they couldn't find a stunt double to match his height, plus he had to wear lifts on his feet, further increasing his height. Mateus revealed this movie was his best experience as an actor. Ex-NBA player Jay Billis plays Azek, credited as the good alien. He is the extraterrestrial police officer that is hunting down Talek. He realises that Kane and Larry are also tracking down the dealer and after being wounded, he approaches them for assistance. Unlike Talek, he is fluent in English. Betsy Bradley plays Diane Pallone, a coroner and Kane's on-off girlfriend. Kane keeps letting her down when they try to make time for each other. She is the first to catch on that the random deaths in the city are linked and are not your typical homicides. We also have some familiar faces playing small cameo roles. Sherman Howard as the drug dealer Victor Manning, I'm sure some of you may remember Sherman playing Lex Luthor in the Superboy TV show and Bub from Day of the Dead. We have Michael J. Pollard playing Bona, a petty criminal. Michael had just starred in Tango and Cash, Dick Tracy, and also played a role in the Superboy TV show as well. And finally, we have Kevin Page playing one of the white boy gang members. He played Kenny from Robocop. He gets gunned down by Ed 209. The movie opens with the alien drug dealer Talek landing on Earth, announcing to a random witness that he has come in peace. A drug gang by the name of the White Boys steal a shipment of heroin from a federal evidence warehouse, and they blow it up to hide their involvement. 
Across town, Houston cop Jack Kane is investigating a drug deal involving the gang. His partner is undercover pretending to be a dealer, but his cover is blown. His partner is killed off and the alien has arrived to take the drugs and takes the rest of the gang members out with his cd light weapon that cuts through them like butter. Kane is distracted by a store robbery and is too late to save his friend. Due to the attack from earlier by the white boys, the FBI are investigating the scene and grill Kane for evidence and his involvement in the case. They want him involved and send him his new partner, Agent Arwood. They return to the crime scene and discover the cd light weapon and find out it's not man-made. Smith wants Kane to follow official procedures, but Kane ignores him. He disregards Smith's interference and begins to suspect that the feds are investigating more than just the white boys. Diane the coroner is investigating the random deaths around the city that all exhibit the same wounds. Kane and Arwood are left puzzled. The corpses are full of heroin, but the cause of death is not a drug overdose. Kane in his anger bursts into the headquarters of the drug gang, but is outnumbered and is used as a pawn to do a drug trade. As he attempts to complete the deal, the alien Talek intervenes and steals the drugs. Kane realises there is another who is hunting down Talek and appears to be on their side. Kane starts piecing the evidence together and realises these mysterious men are not from Earth. Dark Angel doesn't exhibit any big optical effects or matte paintings. It does have the odd animated visual effect mostly for the shots of the CD weapon making impact against the set pieces, but it attempts to do everything within camera, which makes it stand the test of time. All the special effects, such as the big explosions, are done for real. The director always tried to keep all the actors in shot for the big explosions. The special effects chief was Bruno Van Zeebrock, who had worked on Return of the Jedi, Dune, Predator and Die Hard. Dark Angel was his first film in which he was the effects supervisor. Him and the director pushed for many spectacular pyrotechnic effects. Some of the best sequences of these effects is during the attack outside Kane's apartment and as the battle continues on the road as they are chased after the alien. Matthias did handle all of his own stunts apart from the car chase. For the sequence where he jumps over the cars, he did it all in one take and had to run at a quick pace with lifts on his feet. Incredibly difficult and dangerous, but he pulled it off. The gun expert on the movie also worked on Robocop and designed his gun, was asked by Craig Baxley to come up with something better to try and top that design. This new gun fires far more rounds of ammunition, once triggered, but got very hot quickly resulting in them having to be frequently replaced. For the CD-like weapon, they literally had a CD on a motor with the camera mounted behind it and had the cameraman run around the set as it chased the actors. Multi-Grammy Award winner Jan Hammer composed the score. Jan is best known for his work in the 80s, most notably for the TV show Miami Vice. The music for the film follows a similar style, very heavy on synthesizers and with added instrumental guitar cues. The music perfectly suits the film, and Jan Hammer provides some nice themes to open the movie and complements the action scenes and more personal moments. Sadly, there was no soundtrack released at the time, with many low-budget movies, a soundtrack is often never considered, but with a popular artist involved, such as Jan Hammer, it would have been a good opportunity to put some of his work out there to the public. There is the odd track online, and some fans have produced covers of his music, but sadly there has been no discussion of a proper release, or even a limited print run of the score. The film does include a few songs that are featured throughout the film, Maggie performed by XYZ, Thumbs Up by Bardot, Ugly by the U Crew, and during the end credits, it has the song Touch Me Tonight by the band Shooting Star. You can easily find all these tunes on YouTube. Dark Angel was a movie I totally missed during my youth. I always saw it on the shelves during my regular visits to my local rental store, but never got round to seeing it. None of my close friends ever mentioned it or owned it, so it was one of those films I forgot about for years. During my early teens, I was a big fan of Jean-Claude Van Damme, and most often would seek out his movies instead. I was fully aware of Dolph Lundgren of course, I loved Rocky IV, Masters of the Universe and Universal Soldier, but was never that drawn to see the other movies in his catalogue of work. Dolph had less success than Van Damme, Seagal and especially Stallone and Schwarzenegger, so there were fewer movies readily available for me to pick up. His last big theatrical film in the 90s was playing a villain in the 95 movie Johnny Mnemonic. There were other movies here and there, but they were never given big theatrical runs. 
Dolph Lundgren kind of had a career resurgence thanks to the Expendables series. I've always had huge respect for the guy. He is a very intelligent man, having a master's degree in chemical engineering is not to be scoffed at, and he has a good understanding of many other languages. He definitely has a wider range of acting skills than Van Damme and Seagal though, but his technique on film was never that impressive. When it came to fighting, it lacked the showmanship of say Van Damme, who was far more of a show-off for the camera, and his kicks on film looked great, while Dolph was this lumbering mountain of muscle and always pulled some funny faces when it came to the punch-ups, but I still wouldn't want to be kicked in the face by him. Actually, in the film, when he spinning back kicked one of the thugs, his foot connected with the guy who missed his mark, and he knocked him out cold. Nice. The story for the film is genuinely unique and original. Having a drug dealing alien visiting Earth to harvest our endorphins to sell onto the highest bidder on another planet, it's not often you come across a plot line like this, especially in a Hollywood action flick. But sadly, you are given little background information on Talek and the agent who is after him. Talek turns up on Earth and lands off camera. You don't see an alien spacecraft or anything like that. He turns up in this crater and goes on a killing spree. The alien twist to the plot is very weak, to be honest. The movie has its budget restrictions, so I can forgive any sort of large-scale optical work to sell the idea of them visiting, but more dialogue could have been given to sell the idea of who they are. Mateus only says, I come in peace, and that's it. They could have made an effort to flesh out his character and include more scenes of the other alien. You only really get more information on them as the agent tracks down Kane and Larry after being wounded and pleads with them to help him. The movie's real selling point is its action. It's very impressive. We have a movie here that is handled and directed by experienced stuntmen and second unit directors. I do miss the old over the top set pieces of the 80s and early 90s. Everything just seems so dangerous for the actors. It's like they are on the verge of breaking health and safety laws. I think probably back then they got away with a lot and today no one would risk it in the case of being sued or someone dying. One thing that does let the action scenes down is the sound mix. If you listen to the film on a home cinema, there is no punch to the sound effects. Everything seems very muted and flat. With the added extra push of bass and sound design, it would have given the movie an extra level of excitement to boost those set pieces. Despite its small budget, the movie does have a great look. The cinema photography is handled by Mark Irwin, who worked a lot with David Cronenberg on films like Scanners, Videodrome and The Fly, and after working on this film he jumped onto Robocop 2, which was also shot in the same city. It's a shame now that Mark Irwin is lumped with doing mostly comedy films. His rich catalogue of horror movies made him a popular choice in the 90s. There is some nice nuggets of humour thrown into the movie. Dolph seems to gel with a light-hearted approach to the banter he has with his partner and his girlfriend. This movie is a typical buddy cop affair. It's dealing with traditional crime themes, such as drugs and gangs, but throws in the alien twist to give it something more than just being a generic buddy cop movie. After Lethal Weapon did so well, the buddy cop genre became so popular, resulting in loads of copycats during that time, and Dark Angel tried to do something different with it. It's always a challenge for a director to cast two actors who have chemistry to give life to their scenes. Dolph and Brian seem a good match. It's little and large going after an alien, and along the way you get some wise cracking dialogue and a few high flying kicks. What's not to like? I would happily recommend this movie. It's fun, silly entertainment. It's not to be taken seriously. You have solid action sequences balanced out with some good performances and a serviceable storyline. Dark Angel is very much a straight to home video affair. If something like this was released today, it would never come out on the big screen. In the early 90s, this type of movie would often be distributed worldwide in a big way. I think with Canon films dominating the 80s with these low budget type movies, it would seem very common. But today, if it was released, it would go straight to Netflix or your local DVD aisle at your supermarket. As I said, this alien aspect is very weak, but I can forgive those problems because everything else seems to fall into place to deliver an enjoyable experience. You can easily pick the film apart and just write it off, but if you give it a chance and see it through, you will find yourself smiling and laughing at the funny scenes and being pleasantly surprised by its solid action. I don't have a nostalgic connection to it. As I said, I was aware of it for all these years, but just never got round to seeing it. It's not until I got hold of the Blu-ray recently, 
I finally got a chance and felt bad for ignoring it for so long. As a kid I know I would have loved to have seen this and got my friends interested in it as well, but now thankfully I can add it to my collection and be happy I finally own it. What is that? Looks like we've got what he came for. If you enjoyed the video, you can find more on my YouTube channel, and also you can follow me on Twitter. If you want to help support the channel, you can donate through Patreon and receive monthly perks such as updates on the latest news on my channel, early access to reviews and commentaries before they go live on YouTube. Even the smallest donation can help keep this channel going. Thank you.